Hello and welcome back to another video and today I'm going to be doing the first server build that I have ever done on the channel. The reason for doing it, this server is going to be for me and it's going to be a backup for all the video files I have amassed over my time building on YouTube. Now, I had been storing them in the PC behind me. It's getting pretty full. I'm looking for a better solution to do that. And I'm going to be using Onraid as the operating system on the server. Reason for that is I do have a mixture of hard drives. I don't want to purchase a whole lot at once and I want the flexibility to add them in as we go and not have them all of the same size. And I'm a complete noob to servers. I've never built one before. So it looks like a pretty easy user interface compared to some of the other options that are available. And in general, I don't mind that the speeds aren't going to be as quick as some of the other options. If I don't like it, I can always change it in the future. So in terms of assembling all the hardware, this should be pretty straightforward. This is what I do all the time on the channel. The bit I'm a little bit more unsure of is the software setup, but hopefully it goes okay and we get all the parts together at the end of the video and working. So I'll bring you guys along for the journey. And I want to say a special thank you to Fractal Design for sending out their Mesh of i2 for the build. I think this is going to be the perfect case for me and I'll explain the reasons later on. And as well, they've also sent me out some great gear to wear for the video as well. You'll find all the other parts linked in the description, so let's make a start. So the reason I've gone for the Meshify 2 is you can fit absolutely loads of drives in it. It's up to 14 3.5 inch drives plus up to 4 2.5 inch drives. You will have to purchase some additional drive trays to allow you to do this, but that's not going to be a problem. I've got plenty of space as well, so I'm not worried about space and I would rather have good cooling and flexibility in a case to add drives in easily without having to worry about squeezing them in to a smaller case. I have done a full step-by-step -step build guide in this case and I'll link that in the description. So for today I'm going to be focusing just on what I need to do to build this server rather than pointing out every one of the case's features. So because I am going to be having the hard drives on display in the main body of the case, I'm not planning on installing a graphics card, it's not going to be the best looking build that I've put together. So I was happy to go with the version of the case with the steel side panel rather than the tempered glass panel. But if you want to have a tempered glass panel, there's lots of options in this case, including lots of different color options. So to remove the side panel, it's just a simple matter of pulling it out and lifting away. And our other side panel is removed in exactly the same way. We've got this really nice cover plate down at the bottom. So it's just a matter of freeing it up at the top. And then we're going to be able to tilt the panel out and lift it away. So I do think the front of this case is absolutely gorgeous. The front is a little door, we can just simply pop it out and you can see the Fractal have installed two 140mm fans at the front. We've got another 140mm fan at the rear. We've got a nice fan hub up at the top of the case and lots of premium features in this case. Nice cable raceways, Velcro cable straps and good quality rubber grommets. Our case's top panel simply pops off. Again, coming from Fractal with dust filters absolutely everywhere. And to give us good access to the case during the building process, the top panel is removable, it's held on with two screws. And with the screws removed, we can simply tilt the top panel up and lift away. At the front of the case, we've got these two little covers. So if you're going with a big thick radiator down to the bottom, you can maybe remove the first one. An even thicker radiator, you can remove the second one. We're going to need to remove them for a different reason because we're going to be converting this case to storage mode to give us loads of compatibility for our hard drives. And our case's front panel is removable. First of all, we're going to have to remove the dust filter at the bottom. And then that's going to allow us to get our hand in onto the front panel and simply pulls off. So moving into the back of the case and let's focus on the storage. We've got two dedicated two and a half inch drive mounting brackets here behind the motherboard. They simply loosen the thumb screw and then you're going to be able to lift the bracket up and away. So it is possible to move these brackets through to the main compartment and they simply slot onto the power supply surround. So Fractal Design do sell these brackets separately. So if you were to pick up an additional two of these, you could have two in the back and two at the front giving you a total of four dedicated two and a half inch drive mounting locations in the case. We've also got a hard drive cage down at the bottom of the case with two drive trays in it. Just a matter of loosening the thumb screw and then the drive cage is going to be able to be removed. And on each of these drive trays you can see we've got mounting holes for either a two and a half inch drive or three and a half inch drive. And the position of this hard drive cage is adjustable. There's four screws on the bottom which we need to loosen. And then you're going to be able to slide the hard drive cage into the position that you want, either further to the front or further to the back, and then tighten up the screws at the bottom, keep it in the place that you want. The other option that you have is actually remove the hard drive cage altogether, and that's then going to open up two 140mm fan mounting slots at the bottom if you wanted additional cooling. So you think I've gone absolutely mad picking this case when it only has two 3.5 inch drive mounts, 
and two two and a half inch drive mounts out of the box. I haven't, this case has this trick up its sleeve and you can actually convert it into storage mode where it can accommodate up to a maximum of 14 three and a half inch drives. So to do this, there's five screws we're gonna to have to remove. There's one at the top, one at the bottom and three at the front. So with all the screws removed, this panel is now free and we're gonna be able to remove it from the case. So just before we move it to the front, we're gonna to need to remove this multi-bracket because this is actually where our drive trays are going to mount. So if we turn things around, we just need to remove this cover and you can see on the back of it, we've got four screws holding the multi-bracket in place. And then with all the screws removed, so we turn things around, our multi-bracket is then free. And we're then gonna be able to replace the cover, just a matter of slotting it into place and then pushing back down. We can then slide the panel into place at the front and then re-secure up with the screws we have removed. To get our last screw in at the top, we're going to need to return our case's top panel. And you see that's then going to line up with the hole at the top and we can put our last screw in. So down at the bottom, we've already got two drive trays and if you wanted, it is possible to take these out of the hard drive cage and move them further up. But in the case accessory box, Fractal include four of these drive trays. So in terms of mounting them, you've got little slots at the back here. So all you're going to want to do is slide the drive tray into that slot. You're then going to simply push it back into place and then secure it with a thumb screw. So it seems an awful shame to have to stop there, but fortunately Fractal do sell the drive trays as optional extras. Okay, so that's all the drive trays I have, but what I will do, there's two additional slots up here. The top two look really close together. So what I'm gonna do is move the drive trays from the hard drive cage up to the top, just to test out whether you could fit a three and a half inch drive in both of the ones at the top. Okay, so this is what it looks like with 10 brackets mounted up above the hard drive cage. So you can see this slot at the top isn't a full slot. You're not gonna be able to actually fit a three and a half inch drive in there, whereas in all the other drive cages, you're not gonna have any bother with a three and a half inch drive. So in reality, I think it's really nine drive trays up above the hard drive cage with two in the drive cage itself. So I think what I'm gonna do is just remove one of these drive trays and move one of them down to the hard drive cage. So as if that wasn't enough storage, remember the little multi-bracket that we removed earlier on? You are on the back of this gonna be able to mount either a three and a half inch or two and a half inch drive. So you can see the cutouts on the back of this line up with the screw holes in the hard drive. And remember down at the bottom I said there was actually two 140 millimeter fan mounting slots. In the second fan mounting slot, you are actually able to mount this multi-bracket with a three and a half inch drive mounted on it here. And you can see here you've still got plenty of room for your power supply. So if you did pick yourself with an additional two multi-brackets from Fractal, you are able to mount two three and a half inch drives at the top of the case. So it's gonna be one here and one here. So hopefully the reason I've picked this case is now clear. Although I'm only gonna be installing five three and a half inch drives today, I've got absolutely loads of flexibility to expand as time goes on. Okay, for the motherboard, I'm gonna use an MSI at B560 Tomahawk Wi-Fi, and for the CPU, we're gonna be using Intel's 11500. We're gonna be installing our CPU, our CPU cutter, our M.2 SSD, and our RAM before putting the motherboard into the case. To open the socket cover, we're gonna to need to push this lever down and out, bring it all the way to the top of the motherboard, and then we're gonna be able to open the socket cover up. We're then gonna lower the CPU down into the socket. There's notches on each side, which are gonna help make sure it's in the right way round. And then we can go ahead and close the socket cover down again. And as we close this lever, the black bit of plastic should pop off and we'll put it in the motherboard box for safekeeping. So I'm gonna be using a one terabyte Gen 4 NVMe drive from Adata, it's their Legend 960, and it's gonna be my cache drive. So we can set our drive into the slot, flatten it down, and then re-secure it with the screw. If your motherboard's new, there'll be some plastic protection in the back of the heatsink to remove, and then we can return our heatsink. For RAM, I'm gonna be using 32 gigabits of DDR4 from Silicon Power. So we can open the clips on the slots. And then all we need to do is line the RAM up with the slots and push into place. So we can set the bracket for our CPU cooler through the holes in the back of the motherboard. Then we've got one of these standoffs to screw onto each corner. 
Then we can set one bracket on either side of the CPU. And because we've got an LGA 1200 socket, we're going to win it just odd in the hole closest to the middle on the bracket. Then we can add some thermal paste to the centre of the CPU. Just before we do our CPU cutter down, we've got this little bit of metal which we're going to slot in at the bottom. And then we can lower the CPU cutter down, line it up with the bracket beneath. Then we just want to get a screw on each side, and we'll tighten each side up in turn. So this CPU cutter is bringing back bad memories. I can remember from before, with all four sticks of RAM in, I had real trouble mounting the front fan. So we set our front fan into place. You can see the clip here is going to be well above where it needs to actually clip on to. So we've got two options. We can either remove two sticks of RAM, and with one stick removed, this will sit down nicely into place. Or the other option would be just to move the fan to the back and have it pulling air through the cutter rather than pushing. So I just don't like the fan on the back in terms of the aesthetics. I know I can't see it because it's hidden behind the steel panel, but it will just drive me mad knowing that it's there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove two sticks of RAM, allowing me to get the fan on at the front. And then what I do, I have another kit of 32 gigabytes of RAM. They're two 16 gigabyte sticks. I just don't have this kit directly on hand to do the build today, but in the future, I will swap it out. So just before installing the fan, I'm just going to plug it into the CPU fan header. Then I can route the cable down beneath the RAM. Then it's just a matter of taking these little clips and slotting them through the fans. So there we go, our fan fits nicely down behind the two sticks of RAM and no issues with the fan spinning. We can then set the motherboard into the case, line it up with the standoffs at the back, and then we're going to secure it into place using eight of the motherboard screws from the case accessory box. Next, to get our case cables plugged in, HD audio cable is going to, going to go into the header in the bottom left hand side of the motherboard. We've got a fan header down at the motherboard, so we'll plug the PWM cable coming from our fan hub into the header. Our front panel cables are going to go into this header second from the right hand side at the bottom of the motherboard. Make sure you plug them into the same pins as I'm showing you here. Then we've got our USB 3.0 header here, and then just below it our front panel type C header. And then at this stage I'm just going to plug in our SATA data cables. So I'm going to plug two in down at the bottom, and we've got four ports on this side. And then at the top of the case we need to plug our case fans into our fan hub. On the back of the case we've got a power supply bracket which is held on with two thumb screws. And we can secure the bracket to the back of our power supply using the four power supply screws. We can then pass all the cables coming from our power supply through to the case. Then we can slide the power supply into place, making sure the fan is facing down the way. And then we can secure the power supply into place by tightening up the two thumb screws. We have got an 8 and 4 pin EPS cable up at the top left of the motherboard to plug in. And we've got our 24 pin cable to plug in. Our power supply has some RGB effects on it. I am going to plug the RGB cable into the motherboard, but there is an LED button which turns all the lighting off, so that's my plan is just to turn it off. Then at the back of the case, we've got the SATA cable coming in from our fan hub to plug into the SATA cable coming from our power supply. So next we're ready to install our hard drives, and I'm going to be making a start with five hard drives, and obviously I've got loads of room to expand going forward. So to mount our drives in the drive tray, we just need to take these little rubber mounts. We're going to pass them in through the big hole and then pull them to the side. And it's just the two front locations on each side of the drive tray that we're going to put these into. So in terms of the drives I'm using, I have picked up two Iron Wolf 8TB NAS drives, but I am also planning on using some of my own hard drives that I already had. So we've got two 2 terabyte drives and also a 4 terabyte drive, and these are Seagate Barracuda drives. Um, I know these aren't proper NAS drives, but my plan is to, rather than waste 8 terabytes of space, which would cost me about £200 for one of these, I'm going to use these. If they do fail, I'll replace it with a proper NAS drive. But with the way OnRaid works, um, I'm hoping that these drives should be okay in it. And then we're going to use the included hard drive screws to secure the drives to the brackets. So then we can set our drives into the case. And then we just need to plug in a SATA data cable and a SATA power cable. 
So the motherboard does have one more SATA location slot and you'll notice I did plug in an additional SATA cable and I've got 12 SATA power connectors coming from our power supply so I plugged all these in so when I want to add extra drives in the future it is going to be a little bit easier. And again if I want to go above the six SATA ports I've got the PCIe slots free on our motherboard where we're going to be able to add in SATA cards via it. Last thing to do then is some cable management. So before we start working on the NAS, we're going to have to make a bitable USB drive with Unraid on it. Unraid is actually going to load off the USB drive. This is going to stay in our NAS all the time, and then it's going to run in the memory. But we're going to have to leave this plugged in. So in terms of the USB drive that Unraid recommend, it needs to be between 2 and 32 gigabytes, and it needs to have a globally unique identifier. Um, I'm going to be using a SanDisk Cruiser Blade 16 gigabyte stick. So what we can do is we can pop this into our PC. And then we can head over to unraid.net and click on free trial. So this is going to give me the option to try Unraid 3 for up to 30 days to make sure I'm happy with it before I buy it. So you're going to download the USB creator and you've got a choice of Mac or Windows. I'm on a Windows PC so I'll click Windows. And then we can click on the file. And click yes. Okay so on here we can select the version of Unraid that we want to go for. I'm going to go for stable version and I'm just going to go for the latest one available. Um, we can name our NAS, I'm just going to call it NAS. And then we can choose how we want to set up our IP. I'm happy for the DHCP to assign an IP address. Um, if you prefer static IP, you can click here and set it up yourself. And here we can just pick our drive. Um, so it's picked up our SanDisk Cruiser Blade USB drive. If it's not showing up, you can click this button to refresh your devices. Really important, make sure it's the drive that you want to install it on because everything is going to be wiped on it. And then we can just click on write. It's going to give us a warning. We're going to go erase and write. Okay, that's just done. We can click on close. We can eject the disk. And we're now ready to move over to the NAS. Okay, so I've got our NAS connected up to a monitor. I plugged in a keyboard and mouse and also an Ethernet cable and it's time to flip the power switch and see what happens. So that's a good sign. We've got our fan spinning. We've also got lighting on the RAM and we're just going to keep an eye on the monitor and see what happens with the PC. So that's good. Our system is loaded into the BIOS and we're going to make a few changes here. Okay, so we're going to get a lot of information on our BIOS's home screen. So we can see our temperature is nice and cool at 28 degrees at the moment. Um, we can see our motherboard, the CPU that we've got installed, and our memory that's available. We've got the version of the BIOS, and actually I did update this to the latest version before I removed this from my son's PC, so there's no need to do a BIOS update. In terms of the other things to look at, we can look at our CPU color tuning. This did pop up briefly at the start, and the main thing that this controls is the power limit. So we have a tar air cooler. We're going to click yes. If we head over and take a look at our memory, we can see that it has picked up our two sticks of 8 gigabytes. And if we want to enable an XMP profile, we just need to click here. We can go over and click on our storage tab. So in terms of our drives, it's picking up all five of our hard drives and our M.2 SSD as well. So they all look to be present and showing up. And then I want to move over and take a look at our fans. Okay, and we'll click on the settings. So we've only got fans plugged into two of the fan headers. So we've got our CPU fan, 
which is running in PWM mode on the smart fan curve. And we did want to customize our fan curves, but we could do it from here. It looks to be running reasonably slow rate at the moment. I'm quite happy with it. So the only other place we have fans installed is our fan hub into system fan header number two. And the case fans do seem to be a little bit loud at the moment. Um, it is a PWM fan hub, so I'm going to select PWM. And the other thing we can do is load up our smart fan mode. And we are going to be able to adjust the fan curve. So if I want to take this down, I can just click over here and type in 30. And we've got our fans reacting to the CPU core temperature. So they're definitely running a little bit quieter now. I'm happier with that. We can then plug the USB drive with Unreal loaded into it into one of the USB ports on the back of the PC. And we can head over to the Advanced tab, Settings, and click on Boot. I'm just going to save our changes so far. Click on Yes. And then I'm just going to press the Delete key to re-enter the BIOS. So that has now got our USB key on our SanDisk partition one to show up. I'm just going to drag that to the first position. Now, not something I know an awful lot about, but if you are wanting to run virtual machines on your NAS, um, you need to have Intel virtualization technology enabled, which we currently have. I think there is more options of this in the advanced menu. And click on the overclocking settings. And then if we click on CPU features, you can see that we've got Intel virtualization tech enabled. I'm also going to enable VTD tech. Okay, so now we can reboot our PC and hopefully Unread will load off the USB. So we can click on the settings, click on the save and exit, and we're going to save changes and reboot. And click on yes. Okay, so there's nothing for us to click here. We just leave this alone and let it do its work. Okay, so that's it done. You can see the IP address down at the bottom of the screen. So that's where we're going to have to go to on a different computer and we'll be able to set up our NAS remotely. Okay, so to access the NAS, we just need to type in the IP address that came up at the bottom of the install screen. And what it's going to want us to do is secure our server by typing in a password for root. Okay, so I've created a password and I'm going to click set password. So we've now got a choice. We can go ahead and purchase our key or we can go ahead with a 30-day trial. So I'm just going to start the 30-day trial. And I'm then going to have to sign in or sign up. So I don't have an account, so I'm going to go ahead and sign up. Okay, so that's me signed up. I just need to confirm the free trial. Okay, so I can go ahead and click on the dashboard. Okay, so this is where we're going to get some information about our NAS. Um, you can see all our hardware information. You can see that I've got a six-core CPU, and we can see the current overall use of it and the individual cores as well. We've got our RAM, we've got 16 gigabytes, um, and how much is actually currently in use as well. We've got some information about our network, shares and users, we don't have any shares yet. Um, we've only got the root account, I'll create one for myself a little bit later on. We haven't assigned any parity disks, our array is currently stopped, and we've got information on our drives. We've got temperatures, and they're currently showing us healthy. So the, probably the most interesting tab is to head over to the main tab where we're going to be able to set things up. So the first thing to do is set up a parity disk. And the important thing with Onraid is this is going to be the largest drive that you're going to be able to add in the future. So for example, if I set up an eight terabyte drive as my parity drive, eight terabytes is then going to be the maximum that I'm going to be used for all other drives in the array. So I'm not going to be able to add a 12 terabyte drive in. It's eight terabytes or less. So what I'm going to do is pick one of my largest drives. So we'll pick the 8 terabyte drive here. And then I'll head over to our other disks. And I'm just going to add these in in order. And again, if I don't want so many of these slots to appear, I can reduce this down. So let's take it down just to 10 for now. And it's just going to mean we're not going to have so many showing up on the screen. Okay, so next thing to do is add a cache pull. So we'll click Add Pull. It's called Cache, and it's just going to have one slot at the moment. So I'm going to click on Add. So it's currently on unsigned at the moment. So we're going to use our NVMe drive for it. So we'll click here. And we can see down below we've got our flash, which is actually our USB drive 
where Unread is loading from. So in summary, we've got an eight terabyte drive for our Parity, and we've got a combination of four drives, giving us a total of 16 terabytes of usable storage. And then we've got a one terabyte NVMe drive, which we're gonna use as our cache. So we can go ahead and click on Start. It's gonna warn us that the disks are gonna be overwritten. We'll click on Proceed. So you'll notice we're getting a little pop-up saying here, our drives are on mountable. So we are gonna to have to format these. So we'll click here, yes, I want to do this. We're gonna get a warning, but we're gonna go ahead and click on OK. And then we're gonna be able to click on Format to format our other drives. Okay, so that's all our drives finished formatting. You can see at the moment our Parity Sync is currently in progress. It is gonna take quite a while. It's estimated it's gonna be over 12 hours to finish. Okay, next thing to do is head over to the Users tab. And you can see at the moment we just have one user labeled root. So I'm gonna add myself in as a user. So I'm just gonna add a logo in. And then I need to create a password. So we'll create a password and then we'll click on Add. So it doesn't like the capital C at the start, so we'll try Add again. Okay, and then if we go back to Users, we've got Chris showing up here with the logo. Okay, next thing to do is set up some shares. So I'm gonna click on Add Share, and I'm gonna call it Videos. And I would like this to initially go on to the cache, so we'll click on Cache to give us faster transfer times. And in terms of the secondary storage, I want this to be on the array. If you want to include disks, you can pick the disks that you want or exclude certain disks, you've got options here. I'm initially just gonna be setting this up with the default settings and then the mover action is gonna move from the cache to the array. So we're gonna add the share. If you're not sure what any of the options are, you can just click on them and it's going to explain things to you and click again to get disappear. So in terms of exporting, I'm gonna click on yes. Um, and in terms of the security, and I'm gonna keep this as private and click on apply. And now that we've set the share up, we need to define the access for the different users. So for myself under Chris, I'm gonna give myself read and write access and click on apply. Okay, so now that we've created our share, the next thing we're going to want to do is access it. So you open File Explorer, we can click on these three dots here and click Map Network Drive. So the first thing we can do is give our share a drive letter. So you can see at the moment it's picked Z, I'm happy with that. And then we're gonna to have to type in the address for our folder. You see it's given us an example here. So we can type backslash, backslash, and then it's the IP of our server. Then we can hit uh, backslash again and type in videos. We're gonna connect using different credentials and click on finish. Then we're gonna to have to log in and this is the login details that we created with the user Chris. I'm gonna click on remember my credentials and click on OK. So go back to this PC, we can now see that our network location is now showing up, it's labeled videos, and we've got the letter Z next to it. So now what I want to do is test the speed of offloading some files. So generally I would tend to make about three videos uh, per project, so there's a Fantex NV7. So let's copy all those 64 gigabytes, and we'll paste those over onto our device. So that's gonna be copied over to the cache. Um, so that's where we're getting a reasonable speed of just over 100 megabytes per second. Okay, if we click on our videos folder, we can see that our files have actually copied across and let's load one of them up and see will it actually play off the NAS and it does. So this is a 4K video, it is important to say that it hasn't been moved over to the array, it's still running off our SSD in the cache but it's actually playing quite nicely from it. We can skip along. And that's all working fairly well. Okay, last thing I want to do is head over to our apps tab and I'm gonna install the community applications. And click on done. And I understand. And I understand. So I'm gonna have a good look through here and see if there's anything that takes my interest. 
So I really enjoy putting this NAS together. There's about 11 hours left in the parity sync and once that's been done, I'm gonna start getting my data moved across to it. I probably have about eight terabytes of files to move across. And as you've seen, the data transfer rate is quite slow, so it's gonna take quite a bit of time. And importantly, that data transfer rate that we have seen was writing from my PC to the cache in this. And as I have more data than the cache can hold, it's gonna to have to write directly to the array. So the rate of transfer is probably gonna be even slower. But that's one of the things I'm really looking forward to find out. Where are the bottlenecks? How can I optimize things? How can I customize this to get the best for my own individual needs? For example, there may be files that I want to keep in the cache for maybe a month or so, and then automatically move over to the array. And I'm sure there is ways for me to do this. And it's just having a bit of a play with all those different menus, all the different settings, and that's something I'm really looking forward to doing over the next days or weeks. Again, something that was quite good for me to do was actually take on a new project that I didn't know how to do. And I was doing what a lot of you are doing when you're copying my full step-by-step -step build guides. You're following along to them as you actually do the build, and that's what I did today. Setting up the hardware was straightforward, no bother, but actually the software side of things, then I had needed to stop, load up a YouTube video, and follow along to what others had done. So I'm no way trying to make a step-by-step -step guide to setting up on RAID. I don't have the knowledge to do that yet. Maybe in the future I will. Um, but what I will do is link to others' videos in the description that I have found useful and they have worked without any bother getting me up and running on the first go. If you have watched me doing this and you've said, oh, he's made an obvious mistake, please leave it in the comments or anything that I should be doing to optimize or tweak this NAS. Um, I've really only scratched on the surface of what this can actually do. And like I say, I'm going to be exploring all the other options and offers over the next weeks and months and really looking forward to doing them. So hopefully you have enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you have, please remember to give it a thumbs up. And if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. Thanks for watching.